So, uh, thank you. Uh, the reason I called it Narrative Economics Revisited is that I gave my presidential address for the American Economic Association a year ago called Narrative Economics. And you're right, I'm turning this into a, a, a book, uh, I hope, in another year. Uh, so, uh, what, what am I talking about? Uh, the term narrative economics was already coined in the 1894 edition of the Palgrave Dictionary of Political Economy. Uh, that's not what I mean. They, uh, in that dictionary, narrative economics was design, defined as a brand of economics that took the form of providing narratives about economic events, historical stories. That's not what I mean. Narrative economics is studying other people's narrative, popular narratives, how people think about things that are spread by word of mouth and newspapers <laughs> and books and other media. But we really want to know how people think. Uh, I've been onto this theme for, uh, I wrote about this in my 1984 Brookings paper. Uh, why don't economists study how people think? And, uh, they, they, they like this rationality, like we're consistent all the time and we have this objective utility function and we know the stochastic processes. This is not the world I live in. Uh, people, uh, they've got half-baked theories and the theories are typically uh, uh, connected with celebrities or famous names or there's a human interest to them. Uh, it seems to me that they're there's something like what Richard Dawkins called memes, though that term has changed its meaning also. Uh, it, now, a, a, an internet meme is a stupid thing you see on the internet. <laughs> uh, but there's something like that. And uh, I'm, I'm learning from uh, epidemiology that contagion is an important fact in human life, or all life, but uh, ideas that are contagious spread. Doesn't, it, it, we were talking about fake news. Do, you never find out whether it's true or not, but the impact is based on their contagion. So if they have a nice feel to them, or that they're, they're connected to a nice name. Uh, now, another thing I'm emphasizing in my book, which wasn't in my presidential address, is I like to emphasize not just single narratives, but what I call constellations of narratives. Uh, a, d a lot of different narratives that are spreading uh, in our society along a particular theme. And also, I'm, I'm now this is my latest th distinction to make. We have to, there are also confluences of narratives. W when we, we like to understand big economic events, like depressions or booms. Why do those stand out? Because they're bigger. They're not necessarily fundamentally different. But if you want to understand big events, it's probably because a lot of factors all were pushing in the same direction. There's, there's a lot of unrelated narratives that also contribute to a certain economic situation because they encourage people to think in, according to certain naive theories. And I'm also emphasizing that you can now get closer to quantifying narratives. Well, we saw already <laughs> some of this uh, today uh, with tonality. That's my new word. <laughs> uh, so one thing. Economics and finance are the two fields with the least interest in narratives. Uh, I, uh, I did a study, this is in my presidential address, uh, J, JSTOR count of how many, uh, what percent of articles in each of these fields had the word narrative in it. Uh, other, it but another thing I did, I did it separately uh, for uh, all dates and you can't, the, the one on the right is the, uh, since 2010. Every field is looking at narratives more. So, uh, you know, I think there's a revolution going on, and we see it in this conference. I, I thought it was an exciting uh, uh, theme for a conference because things are happening. We have different data now. We can get closer. We don't have to rely on this rationality assumption. Uh, we can get back and find out what people are thinking. Uh, now, here's an example of. Um, a paper, I actually was presented at this conference last year by Will Getzman, my paper with him. Um, things change in public narratives. So uh, I ask about, I've been doing this since 1989, a questionnaire survey asking how likely do you think a stock market crash like 
1987 or 1929 is in the next six months. And you can see that this should be constant. Economists wouldn't allow you to change your probability. Well, unless it was part of a stochastic process that you could quantify. But you can see that we went through a, 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 I can't see it on the screen, there it is, complacent period right before the financial crisis. We gave a lower probability, that's both individual and institutional inv uh, in investors, with lower probability. So something is changing in terms of what should be probably just an objective and they got it exactly wrong. They gave the lowest probability of a crash right before the 2007 uh, crisis. And it peaked, by the way, in 2000, I can't see, but there it is, uh, 2009. So I like to study these things. Now this is, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go, this is Paul Samuelson, 1939, multiplier accelerator model. This was the thing, I would have been into this too if I were alive in 1939. <laughs> It, it has, uh, it, it ends up being a difference, it's feedback. He's got multiplier and accelerator, uh, and he ends up with, uh, I don't want to spend time on this. Uh, this is also from his article. You can have kind of a hump-shaped pattern of output. Uh, this is initial government expenditure shock. Uh, it's a difference equal damped oscillations. This was exciting in 1939. Uh, but I, I think that this is, a good model, and it's still informing a lot of thinking, this kind of model, but there's another kind of dynamics going on, which is a contagion dynamics. So uh, this was in my presidential address, but this is not original with me. There's a field called mathematical epidemiology, which is medical school. Uh, we learn from different disciplines, and this is a very important model that economists, some economists look at this, but it's pretty small yet. So the model, this is a model of an epidemic where there's complete mixing of the population and the epidemic spreads when one person who is infected with the disease and contagious meets another person who is susceptible. And there's a third category of people who have recovered and they're immune in this model. So it's a very simple thing that uh, this is the key equation. The change in infectives is equal to a contagion rate times the product of the number of susceptibles and infectives. Because the, the more, well, because they have to have a meeting. You need both. So we, we put it in as the product of the two. And then they, that's R is a recovery rate. And they overcome, uh, uh, this is a typo, which creeps, I meant recovery rate for R. There's only two parameters, contagion rate, recovery rate. Uh, these tend to produce hump-shaped epidemics. They can be little epidemics, and they can be big epidemics, or they can be slow epidemics or fast epidemics, but the curve looks hump-shaped typically. I mean, I'll show you a curve. That's, this is a solution to that model. I've got the, it's called the compartmental model. You've got three compartments. Uh, the susceptibles start out at 100%. You introduce one guy who's sick. Uh, there isn't much spread initially because there's only one guy spreading it. But as, as SI goes up, the, the can, it, number of infectives goes up, and eventually it peaks, even though there's no change in the disease. Uh, and then it, it fades away. And then, in this case, almost everyone is eventually infected. That's the, look, I want you to look at that curve. Uh, that's an epidemic curve. Uh, and I, you'll see it again and again in economic things, and I think it's, uh, it, it, now, you can get this in other ways. Samuelson got this kind of hump shape uh, through time in another way. Uh, but I think maybe we need both of these things in, in, to understand these uh, phenomena. So I'll give you an example. I, I start out with it. N note that general hump shape. It can be stretched out or it can be bigger or smaller, but that's the epidemic model uh, that Kermack and McKendrick proposed in 1927. And there, here's some uh, names of famous economists. They're all hump-shaped. If if, these aren't recent famous economists. They're, you have to give them time to start decaying. But um, the, the most famous on this list is Henry George. And you probably don't even know who he is, right? That's because he was 19th century. He was the big guy in the United States. Uh, and now he's faded away to practically nothing. Uh, but they all do that. 
I think this is a little bit depressing when you think of your own career. <laughs> um, it's illustrative to understand, uh, understand that. Uh, I'll give you another example of famous people. That, you know who the guy with his tongue sticking out is? Of course you know who that is. That is one of the most contagious people in the world. Uh, I, I put him alongside Erwin Schrodinger, who is another great physicist. Um, and I challenge you to, to give me a cogent reason why Einstein should be more famous than Schrodinger. But look at the curve. This is a Google engram. Einstein, who died in 1961, has continued to go up for, for uh, and, uh, what's with this? And Erwin Schrodinger, well, he's rising too after dying. <laughs> No, Einstein died in 55. There's something contagious about these guys. But there are even more physicists who you even more obscure, who did great things. Is there any justice in this? Why did Einstein get so famous? I think it's partly because of his hairdo. Uh, <laughs> he, looks, he looks like a, a prophet or a guru. Uh, was what we want a genius to look like. And he's, he has a, a fun side. He sticks out his tongue <laughs> to the camera. So uh, I did the same thing with Karl Marx and Zeus. Uh, Karl Marx tried as hard as he could, but he couldn't quite match Zeus, who doesn't even exist. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other thing, Karl Marx died in 1883. So uh, if you look on the... He wasn't very famous when he died. I think only a dozen people went to his funeral. It was all after, poor guy, he didn't know what he was starting. But uh, he didn't peak until 1960, or the 1970s. Why did Zeus do this? Uh, it's not because he tried hard, because he doesn't exist. Uh, there was a Greek revival in, uh, in Western society in the 18th and 19th century. And you can see it right over there. See those Greek columns? And right, I can't see, I think over there too. And this building has Greek columns. That was a fad in the 17th, 18th, and coming up into, I mean, 18th, 19th, and coming into the 20th century, and it's now dissipating. They wouldn't build a campus like this anymore. I'm thinking, it's again the same epidemic curve that you see. Something made Zeus contagious. I don't know what it is. If they didn't believe in him, why were they talking about him so much? Here's another, but I want to look at things that are economically relevant. And uh, uh, they, I want to, there's lots of fads and uh, contagions going on all the time. But what mattered to me is which ones are connected with economic ideas that will have changed people's behavior. So I, I'm going to give you another example of a contagion uh, that uh, uh, is called the Laffer Curve. Do I have to tell you what the Laffer Curve is? It's probably, you've all been infected, whether you like it or not. But it was a economic, but it, it, it was in very simple terms. Uh, for, uh, Laffer made the, uh, there was a story uh, about Arthur Laffer having dinner with Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld in the uh, two continents restaurant in Washington, a luxury restaurant in, in Washington, D.C. And he pulled out a napkin and he drew this diagram showing tax revenues as a function of tax rates. Uh, and he points out that for any amount of revenue you have to raise, there's always two uh, uh, tax rates that will achieve that revenue. A high tax rate, that's Democratic Party, <laughs> and a low tax rate, that's Republican. Uh, uh, the, the story about this, uh, Jude Wanisky is a newspaper, was a newspaper, worked for the Wall Street Journal, and a writer of popular books. And he had an ear for good stories. That's what you're supposed to do as journalists, I guess, uh, by some accounts. So uh, he, he was writing his book, The Way the World Works, uh, and he, he remembered a dinner, that, this dinner that he had with Art Laffer. So he called Art Laffer up and said, can you remind me what happened? Uh, you, you wrote this diagram on a, on a napkin, and remember? Uh, and Laffer couldn't remember. <laughs> and then he said, um, I don't, that was a fancy restaurant. They had cloth napkins. I wouldn't write on a cloth napkin. But uh, anyway, uh, that story went viral. And I think it had economic, this sounds silly, 
but I think it had economic impact because it justified cutting taxes. That made it contagious. People loved it. And it has a punchline. I didn't say it right. I'm trying to rush over this, but you've heard it before. Everyone remembers this story. So this is a, I've got both a Google uh, Ngrams, which looks at books, and a uh, ProQuest news and newspaper count of, uh, of Laffer curve. That was the Laffer curve I just showed you. By the way, poor Art Laffer is not as famous as his curve is now. Uh, and he actually wrote a book called The Laffer Curve later because he wanted to capitalize. Once you have this kind of windfall, when you go viral, it changes your life because now you can build your career uh, around the, what everybody knows. But you can see it's, uh, it's kind of choppy and irregular, but I think it shows the same hump-shaped epidemic pattern. So the younger of you who have never heard, I'm looking at younger people, <laughs> who, who have never heard of Art Laffer, don't feel bad. You weren't there when the contagion happened. Th that contagion happened at the same time as Rubik's Cube. Have you all heard of that? <laughs> have you heard of <laughs> You've never heard of it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Young people today haven't heard of Rubik's Cube sometimes. They, they come and go, but the cube hasn't changed. Uh, this is a Google Ngram's uh, uh, counts of uh, major macroeconomic models. I've got the ISLM model, the real business cycle model, the overlapping generations model, and the, the one I just showed you, the Samuelson's multiplier accelerator model. And they all have hump-shaped patterns. This has been noted before. This isn't a discovery just of me. There was an article in Science uh, by Michelle et al., uh, looking at how people go, th it's true not just of economists, everywhere people go through hump shapes in their, uh, in their counts. So the multiplier accelerated model I showed you was 1939. It's there. So it got no attention until the 1950s. Then it went up, it's a little jagged here, and then it went in a nice, beautiful epidemic curve. And um, some of you haven't even heard of it. I, I bet, because we're on the tail end of that epidemic. But new epidemics keep getting started. The, in order to be contagious, it has to somehow relate to a constellation of or something else that's contagious, or be att attached to some figure like Donald J. Trump, which would, is in, 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 a big help if you want to have an epidemic. So, uh, this is connected to Donald J. Trump. I, I, I'm, I'm putting this in kind of for completeness and as a sort of caveat about this kind of research. Uh, the search is for trade war, uh, and I did that back to 1800. Uh, you notice where we are now? I can't, uh, I can't see the dot. Well, at the far right. Now, that is a little bit biased because that's for 2018 uh, as if it were a full year. Uh, and so it, it's, it's going to be a little bit lower than that. But we are at a huge peak in trade war. Uh, so what is the history? It looks like there were a lot of short epidemics for trade war. Um, but I, I have to be careful of it because they, uh, they have different meanings in different areas. So what I'm advocating in this book is kind of a combination of quantitative research, economic research, and his history. Well, what they teach you when you get a PhD in history, which is to be careful. Well, I can't summarize it in a sentence, but it's, it's something about being a good historian. So you can't just look at a diagram like this and trust it. Because I looked up what these other trade war, the, th this, um, this trade war, th OK, there's a peak there. That was during the American Civil War. And every article was merely just quoting, uh, referring to the Chicago Board of Trade War Fund. And it, it saw a trade war. <laughs> That's not it at all. In 1900, there was a lot of talk about trade war. But it wasn't about what we think. It was about, they just met a price war where, where people are competing and cutting prices. Then we get to uh, the Great Depression. And now, they're, now that we're talking about a real trade war where one country raises tariffs. Oh, wait, we're, we're doing this. No, this is 1920. Uh, oh, yeah, the trade war in 1920 meant uh, World War I and the efforts that the Allies uh, were using trade policy to, uh, to cut off uh, supplies to the Axis countries. I say that right? Uh, it, was, it was all about the World War I. It wasn't anything to do with what economists call trade war. Uh, 
then it's this one in 1930s that is the one that we are talking about now, where the United States put on the Smoot-Hawley tariff in 1930, and then we, we were retaliated against. Uh, and then here's the, uh, uh, then these are all, something happened after the Great Depression became a legend. Anything connected to that became likely to be contagious. So we now have this impression that trade wars have been with us from uh, time immemorial, and we have to be careful and not do what Donald J. Trump is about to do, or did uh, about to do. But um, it seems like the narrative was different. It, you know, I think we were always in trade wars. It wasn't like there's this big World War II story. It was, they're always retaliating. Uh, all of our tariffs were in, put in retaliation. It's a question of when do you stop retaliating? The, uh, the, the Ford and E. McCumber tariff, the smoot Holly tariff, they were all retaliation. So it's not, it, it's, it's not exactly the story that we have, but it, it's, it's growing right now because we dislike Donald Trump so much. And it, this is a good jab at him, so it's very contagious. Uh, and nobody remembers these trade wars anyway, so. Well, this, this just slide just refers to what I, I said. The size of the epidemic depends on the ratio of the contagion rate to removal rate. You can have epidemics that affect only 5% of the population or epidemics that reflect 95% of the population, depending on C over R. Or you can have really slow epidemics like Zeus, who we still see here today, <laughs> who uh, his epidemic, uh, the classic revival, uh, uh, took centuries. Uh, and it should be no mystery. We have a model that, that explains that. So here's, uh, here's another uh, ep epidemic. That I, I, I'm, what I'm doing in my book is telling a lot of stories. But they're not my stories. They're stories that they told. And I'm trying to put it in there so that as they would understand it. And I'm picking stories that, to me, had uh, impact on e economics. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I'm relying mostly on, well, newspapers and books. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get diaries and sermons, uh, but I haven't gotten there. Uh, I haven't had time yet. Uh, I wish, we, uh, diaries are especially good be, if we can, some of them are digitized now uh, because it's heart, you know, person, heartfelt feelings <laughs> that a person might express there. But this, these are indications of what people were talking about. Uh, I looked up the word profiteer, on, uh, and I found that there was a huge epidemic of profiteer uh, in 1920. Now, the, the 1920-21 depression, as they used to call it, we don't call it, we call it a recession now. Uh, but the it was the sharpest uh, recession we've ever had. At, uh, in between 20 and 21, the consumer price index fell. Uh, 15 percent. That's the biggest drop in one year ever. Uh, what was happening then? Uh, well, first of all, most of us don't remember 1920-21 at all. Uh, they remembered a lot in the Great Depression because that was their narrative. They assumed this is 1920-21 again. Well, what was happening? I, I, I go back and read all the things. Lots of interesting narratives. But I'm just going to pick this one. The word profiteer was invented right around that time to refer to a company that maximizes profits at the expense of people. And it started in World War I, when some people were making millions and other men were dying in, uh, in the war. And it got people really angry and agitated. It didn't stop when the war ended. They were still angry with profiteers. And they were doing boycotts. There were a lot of boycotts. By the way, boycott started out as an epidemic. Did you know this? And Mr. Boycott, that was his name, was uh, af affected by a, a buying, a, he was a victim of a boycott. And he wrote a letter to the editor to the London Times explaining his problems. And it just went viral all around the whole world. And we still are saying boycott, although we've forgotten him. <laughs> so somehow people were boycotting manufacturing out of principle. They, they, were, they weren't uh, Keynesian uh, depression. It was, it was an angry depression. You know, we have emotions and moods associated with it. And somehow that story was extremely contagious. Since then, it has died out. It didn't come back. You might think it would come back in uh, World War II, right around there, but it only came back a little. 
That's because everyone was now super cautious not to do anything that looked like profiteering. And the, the uh, government put on an, uh, excess profits tax, make sure that nobody became a millionaire. So it, it, it was contained that time. Uh, and, and, the, the, and despite expectations, the depression of 1920-21 was not exactly repeated. President Hoover said, we'll get over this uh, depression rapidly. He said, in six months, we'll be out of the depression. And he was wrong. He was just basing it on, I think, the narrative of 1920-21. Here's another one, stock market crash, uh, uh, both newspapers and books. Uh, now, it's very plain that we have two epidemics of the term stock market crash. One is 1929, and the other one is 1987. Uh, so uh, I find this, but in, in newspapers, but not books, I find this uh, amazing. Uh, there's only, so I, I think we have quite definitively, there's only two stock market crashes. Maybe some newspaper people can tell me uh, now, I actually, I write a column every six weeks for the New York Times. Uh, maybe I know the answer to this. Why don't people, I once put crash in one of my articles and my editor was saying, did you mean to say crash? And I realized that that's like shouting fire in a crowded theater or something. Uh, so maybe there's some discipline. Uh, how can it be that they never brought it up again, uh, except referring to those two events? Uh, but I think they're now part, incidentally, uh, stock market crash 1929 has much more longevity than stock market crash 1987. And younger people here have never heard of the crash of 1987, right? <laughs> you've never heard, or you've heard of it. <laughs> uh, and that, that either of these events were narrative epidemics that spread very fast, very fast. Uh, I can tell you about 1987 crash because I was there and uh, it was word of mouth. It wasn't the news media. Uh, it was everyone talking all at, all at once uh, because they thought it was such a... <coughs> Another thing about the depression was the, uh, the, the epidemic in the... That's the blue line. The blue line is technological unemployment. Do you know what? The, I, I think the Great Depression started in a different manner than you would expect. Technological unemployment became a popular term in 1928, just before it starts off growing. Uh, so what was happening? And throughout the early Depression, people thought that the Depression, a lot of people thought, was caused by machines replacing people. That there were, now it used to be that uh, people would, breakfast cereal, they would, they, they, there would be someone at the factory would have a bunch of boxes and would take a scoop and fill the box. By 1928, they had a conveyor belt and a machine that automatically filled the belt. And they thought, this is the uh, 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 epochal event. We're replacing people with machines at such a rate. And they're were called under-consumptionist theories. Uh, in 1928, they were complaining already that the unemployment rate was high even though output was also high. Uh, and uh, so, so they, they had this different theory based on stories of, or also chemi chemical factories that had only two employees who would push buttons and operate mechanical, uh, and the factory just ran itself. That's 1930 or 1931. And the under-consumptionist theory that, you know, we can produce so many things now in 1931 that who's going to buy them anymore? And so there, there's just not going to be jobs. Uh, anyway, I'm telling you narratives from different times. Uh, Luddites, by the way, the Luddites, remember them? You, you have to be really old to remember them. In 1811, there was a, a revolt of weavers who were protesting automated weaving machines. Uh, and so they were called Luddites. We never forgot the Luddites. Look at them. They're just trudging along for 200 years. But they didn't, uh, uh, it, it, I think the meaning changed. A Luddite was someone who opposes progress. And it was an insult to call someone a Luddite. So you could start a whole new Luddite type revolution with a different name in the 1930s. And that's called technological unemployment. 
We're going through the same thing again right now. It's become contagious again. Except what do we call it now? Robotics or uh, uh, machine learning or things like that. Uh, you are already wor the people here who are from journalist background are worried about losing their jobs, but we professors are learning worried about losing. Our, well, we have tenure, but our children, <laughs> our children won't be able to keep their jobs because it's all going to be online and recognized. So, um, oh, so this is one thing I'm just adding to my book. It's, it's, um, I think we should go back and look at puzzles. Uh, and ask what were the narratives around the puzzle. So I, I thought, you know, the stock market, the S&P Composite Index lost 86% of its value in two and a half years, from September 7, 1929 to June 1, 1932. How can it do that? Uh, first of all, were there people sounding warnings that this was going to happen? Not really, not, not down 86% or 82% in real terms. Um, in fact, people were saying, what's going on here with this depression? There's nothing fundamentally wrong. That's Herbert Hoover. But it wasn't just Herbert Hoover. Every business person in the country was saying that. Are people going crazy? Why aren't they buying? We, 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 everything's fine. Uh, so in that, and everything looked fine at that point. Uh, so why did it go down so much? Uh, and there's, uh, I looked for stories that what was popular right around, right before, technological unemployment is one, but also short interest. A lot of people were, sh uh, were allegedly shorting the market. Um, and uh, I looked up short interest, and it was high in 1929, so there is something to this story, but it crashed by 1932. Also, broker's loans or margin credit. There was a lot of talk about that. Um, but there, uh, I don't think I've got it yet. I'm, there, something was changing around, around the time when the market lost 86. But it was all in the form of stories, I think. Um, so um, yeah. Uh, oh, you know, in 1933, Irving Fisher wrote a book called The Debt Deflation Theory of Depressions. And I think he was actually embodying a popular narrative in a mathematical model. But the narrative that preceded Fisher was the narrative, go back to 1932, June of 1932. The market was now down 86%. Isn't that a buying opportunity? But why, so I've been reading newspapers trying to get someone back then to explain to me why that isn't an obvious buying opportunity. Uh, and the, what, what I found, uh, and one thing that happened was that people would say, well, because all the adventuresome people have been wiped out by the decline so far. Uh, and that's what Irving Fisher expanded into it, or by the deflation that it expanded debts. So there is some kind of constellation of narratives that, or confluence of narratives that I think brought it, and could do so today. We could see the stock market down 80% in two years if we had the same perfect storm of narratives. Uh, now, the, the, these are, this is both news in newspapers and books counts for just the term Great Depression. Uh, and uh, first of all, they didn't talk much about the Great Depression during the Great Depression. <laughs> uh, I can't get the clicker to, there, there, if you can see that. It was up a little bit. But the Great Depression has evolved into a legend. Now, unfortunately, this cuts off. Uh, 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 well, it, it shoots up tremendously in 2009. That's why 2009 was so resonant, because people were saying this might be the depression all over again. And the depression is in a folklore status uh, in all of our mind. Maybe not, uh, I ask my students at Yale these things, and it's always uh, impressive to me how often they don't know anything about something I thought everyone knows about. But they'll hear about it eventually, <laughs> because it's in the air. So, uh, okay, I guess it's my last slide. Uh, I think there's a revolution. That's why I like this conference, because it's, I, I think this is on to something. It's not little. It's changing, uh, it's changing the whole way. It's, a new, it's involving a new data source. And it's also this fake news is uh, awakening us to the possibility that people respond to something other than 
genuine information as, uh, as economists are. So I'm thinking that people should continue, but it shouldn't be just studying news. There's other things. I mentioned diaries, sermons, <coughs> uh, focus groups uh, that are already available, and that's what I'm trying to do in my book, but I won't be able to read <laughs> or do. Uh, but I also think uh, we have to take into account the revolution in behavioral economics and neuroeconomics, which is now an emerging field of, with a lot of excitement in it. Uh, and better kinds of searches so we can... Un but uh, uh, I think we need to start collecting data for future researchers uh, my, uh, that, that is suggested, collecting it in a different way rather than having to rely on things like newspapers. But also to couple with the historical method. Uh, so this is something that you learn in a PhD program in history. We haven't heard much from these people. But one thing I think they, they, you learn in a... I, I, didn't, I don't have a PhD in history. But I think one thing you learn from uh, history departments is about going in-depth and uh, not taking words for things, uh, listening to the people, and trying to put together a, a narrative uh, in the old sense of the term uh, about historical... Ultimately, we as economists are historians. Uh, we have to use the best uh, methods, the whole constellation of methods that are available. Okay. <laughs> uh,